Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first Smart Music Seminar of 2022, Fine Tune Your Resolutions to Ring in the New Year. My name is Felicia Alanum, and I'm going to be running everything, everything in the background for you today. Uh, we're thrilled to host today's webinar, and we hope it gets you motivated to start off the year on the right foot. And so with that, I would like to introduce our wonderful presenter for today, Peggy Rakus. Peggy is a lifelong educator who taught instrumental music in North Merrick schools on Long Island, and she is currently an adjunct professor of music education at Hofstra University. She's the founder of Teaching Positivity, an organization that provides a positive psychology workshops for educators across Long Island, and she's a certified optimized life coach specializing in positive psychology. Ms. Rakus is also a longtime fan of smart music and is passionate about sharing her love of smart music with others. During her career, Ms. Rakus was honored with a nomination for the New York State Teacher of the Year and the Disney Teacher Award. Peggy, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you so much to Felicia, to Alfred, to Smart Music for making this webinar available. And thank you to all of you for joining. I, I am deeply honored that you would like to spend the next hour with me. And I hope that by the end, you'll be happy that you did. So before I get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about why I am doing this and why I got into positive psychology. When I was, when I was teaching, it was back, this was maybe like 10 years ago when the testing took over all the schools. And especially for teachers in the arts, we were kind of relegated to the bottom rung of the ladder. And I looked around and I saw all my fellow teachers really, really stressed in a way I had never seen them stressed before. And at that time, I was also deeply stressed. I got into studying positive psychology and how we're gonna fine tune our resolutions today is gonna to be based on, on research from positive psychology. And I fell in love with the subject and I just started my little business of sharing positive psychology classes and webinars with music teachers, with all sorts of teachers. And part of why I'm doing this is because I needed to learn the information. And I think a lot of presenters that you hear, they're presenting because they need to understand this more. And in preparing for this today, this is actually my first presentation on resolutions my resolutions are much better right now. So I wanna thank you for that because I am learning this stuff right along with you. I'm gonna take a moment and share my slides with you and we're going to get started. Okay, so we are going to ring in the new year. In the top of your chat, there is a link to the handout. We have a workshop, a worksheet that we're gonna be doing today. Not essential that you download it, but if anyone does want to go look at the top of the chat, you'll find the link to those resources. All right, I have a joke to start off with. The devil whispered to all the 2022 teachers, you are not strong enough to withstand this storm. And the teachers whispered back, you apostrophe R-E. I'm afraid I've been using this joke for three years and I certainly hope that I do not have to change this joke to 2023. So for all of you teachers, my hat goes out to you, all of you guys in the ring at this moment, you are an essential worker and we are so grateful to have you. All right, so here's the big fine tuning ideas we're gonna to cover today. The first one is probably different than what you would think. We're going to talk about a question that James Clear talks about in his books, Atomic Habits. And he says, before we decide on what kind of habits we wanna install or resolutions, we need to be very clear about who do we want to become. A James Clear wants us very clear. So the second thing we have to do is believe that we can actually do this, believe that we can pull this off, have a growth mindset about ourselves. We are going to talk about how tiny, tiny habits can have big payoffs and how they can compound into incredible results. We're gonna talk about the power of celebration for ourselves to celebrate our achievements, for our students to make sure we are celebrating their achievements. New beginnings are helpful. So here we are in a new year and it has been proven that if you start a new habit on a new year, a Monday or a new week or a new month, your chances of succeeding are a little better than if you started on a random day. Attach your new habit to an existing habit. We're going to talk about something called habit stacking and how to do that. Measure your habit and never miss twice. So we'll talk about trying to do a habit every single day. Be flexible. You might have to miss on your birthday, but don't miss two times. 
along with your tiny habit, we're going to establish a goal habit. Where do you want to go with that habit? And then at the end, I've got a major collection of tiny self-care habits that we're going to go over. So I alluded to the fact that I had a few, uh, that I'm doing this to help myself. And I do have a few regrets about my teaching career, which I loved. I loved teaching. I was in the classroom for 38 years, but I really wish that I had taken better care of myself. I wish I had realized the importance of self-care because often I would go to work and I would just be tired. And I'd look at 125 fourth graders at 745 in the morning. And I was kind of just so tired. By 9.30, I was ready to go home. So what I regret is that I didn't take better care of myself. I didn't realize that I needed to put my oxygen mask on first. And I didn't realize that I was serving from an empty vessel. If I was staying out late at night, I was reading a book and I had to get to the end of it. All of those things just made me tired the next day. So I was sometimes, not always, serving from an empty vessel and how I wish I had known that that was more important. I needed to tie my own shoelaces, basically take care of everything with myself, and then my teaching career would have been that much better. Now, luckily for me, I had a reserve of energy, but I do wish that I had taken better care. Teachers are in the top 10 professions with the highest rates of depression, as are artists and musicians. So if you are a music teacher out there, we have a double whammy here. Now, if we want to take care of ourselves, I would see articles like this, 50 habits of successful people you should adopt. 50. There are 50 habits in this thing talking about, and he even writes here, or she, I don't, can't even remember who this was. I sort of want to blank on it. Here are 50 habits, successful people that you must follow if you want to be successful in life. Must follow. Oh my goodness. How can I do that? 50 habits. I was, I saw this actually, as I was starting these things going, there's, there's got to be a better way. There just has to be a better way. So there is a better way. I'm here to tell you there is great power in one tiny habit. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, to get started, just to get an idea of what habits you wanted to install for your New Year's, would you be so kind, and you certainly don't have to do this, but put in the chat just something a little bit about your New Year's resolution, or if you don't have one, I'd just be curious to see. So put in that chat your New Year's resolution, just in a few words, I want to exercise more, I want to eat more, and let's see what, as a group, are we hoping to do for our resolutions. So let's see and go ahead and type something in there for me. Ah, yes, most, many people do not have New Year's resolutions. I think the statistic is about 55%. Ah, get organized, right? I've got a cue for you, clue for how to get organized. Work-life balance. That was actually what I wanted to know too. How to improvise. Yeah, this would be your own specific, unique, fundamental thing that you need to do. All right, get that book done. Oh, Mr. Cron, you get that book done. Yes, you go, sir. Read more routine established. We're going to talk about that. Live in the now. Oh, yes, yes. That's really, really great, too. Read a book a month. Yay, ski a lot. You go, you go, man. Yeah, that's taking care of your happiness. Collaborate with colleagues. Oh, COVID has taken, taken you apart. I'm sorry. And bring your team back together. Absolutely. There's much more strength in groups than in a single person. Enjoy life one day at a time. I like that one. Thank you guys for these. All right. So now reconnect with personal friends again. That'd be great. Yeah, my, my girlfriend, that's what she's doing too, reconnect. All right. So now we're going to ask you that keeping in mind what you want to accomplish, who do you want to become? And this is from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, that happened to be the top selling book on Amazon for 2021. He has, James Clear has a wonderful email list. He writes you once a week and he gives you just a real concise wisdom that's always right on the money. And all, you're always glad that you read it. So if you guys want and something else to clog up your email, but he won't clog it. You'll be terribly, terribly grateful that you did. All right, so he's gonna have us start with who do we want to become? So now to think about who we want to become, I'm gonna have you think about your favorite teacher. And um, forgive me if you were on my last Smart Music webinar because I had you do this then too, but I wanted to do a little more with it at the end and that's why I'm having you do it again. So take for a minute and think about what do you remember most about your favorite teacher? What were they, were they? warm? Were they loving? Were they kind? Were they caring? 
And if you could also put that in the chat for me, let's see, what do you remember about your favorite teacher? And I will, while we're waiting for you to put a little something in the chat, I'll tell you about my favorite teacher, Mr. Burgess, who was my seventh grade band director who started me on the flute. I was in Virginia, we started in seventh grade and I wanted to play the saxophone, but Mr. Burgess said I was too skinny and I had to play a light instrument. But other than that, he was absolutely magnificent and he cared about me deeply, deeply, deeply. So what I remember about him is his caring. Ooh, funny, smart, intelligent, tough, uh, precisely demanding and full of life, full of life. They challenged me, my high school band director. That's awesome. Yay, David, Sydney. Oh, they could communicate. Ah, that's a great one. Uh, high school band director interested in who I was as a person and very encouraging about my future career. He connected with you. Connection is a huge thing. We're not going to talk about that today, but connecting with our students in a way that's meaningful for them is, is everything. Available. He was always come and hang out if we needed him to. All right. So we had some caring is a big one there. Stern, but always supportive. Gave me everything I needed to become better. That would go under organized too there. All right. Now, what we're going to have you do, and I'm going to have you think about this through the class today, decide the person you want to be. The person that I want to be, as far as my resolutions, I want to be a person who's energetic. So what this has been a battle of mine for a long time, and I have, I've got some of the parts down really much better now, but I still have some room to grow. So I want to be someone who is full, who's vital, who has energy when they walk into the classroom. Um, use, if you're having trouble figuring out, well, who do I want to be? Think of your favorite teacher for inspiration. If you, you know, no matter if you're a teacher or not, think of someone in your life who's totally inspired you and would you like to be like them? And then the idea behind deciding who you're going, who you want to be, is you're going to prove it to yourself with small wins. You're going to prove it to yourself with these tiny little habits that we're going to talk about installing. So Ariana Huffington says that, um, auto Atomic Habits is one of her all time favorite books. It's a quote from it. Atomic Habits are small 1% improvements in behavior that over time compound into full blown behavior change and positive habits. So they compound, they grow on each other. If you get 1% better today, you get 1% better tomorrow, that's gonna have a compounding effect. You're not just 2% better. You're gonna be even more than 2% better. So that's one of the ideas behind these little incremental gains that you're gonna make. And I think as musicians that we need to think of habits like small sections of music or my good friend, Polly Meyerding read my blog and said that she had been taught um, to divide and conquer when you see a piece. And just for fun, I went on online and I Googled complicated music and I got this lovely one right here um that is by it's traditional um prelude and fugue for the last actually my my top of my uh i'm oh my goodness i'm sorry i'm i'm missing and blanking out on the top of it my screen is oh there's pre, prelude and the last hope in c and c sharp minor so this is just a joke piece but if you were going to try to do this you would divide and conquer so that's what polly said when she saw what i was talking about Think of habits like small sections of music. We want to live a flourishing, good life. We need to divide and conquer all the areas of our lives that maybe aren't quite as flourishing as others, and we can conquer them. So just like we wouldn't throw this piece at a kid and say, hey, go ahead and learn this piece, we would divide it up. We would take the first four notes right here, and we would have them learn that little by little. And that's what we're going to do with basic, basically with our lives with this small habit, small resolution plan. Here's another um, wonderful quote that he has here. The more you re repeat a behavior, the more you reinforce the identity associated with that behavior. In fact, the word identity was originally derived from the Latin word essentitas, which means being, and identitum, which means repeatedly. Forgive me if I mispronounced those Latin words. So your identity is literally your repeated beingness. It literally is your habits. As Aristotle so eloquently says here, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So the next thing is once you decided who you want to be and what kind of habits that person might have, you have to believe that you can be that kind of person. And I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about 
my one push-up. So I actually came up with this one push-up plan before I even read Atomic Habits, but some, but you know, it's not brain surge, surge, not brain surgery to figure out that you need to start small in life. So I wanted to do some weight training. So I did decided that I wanted to do one push-up, just one. And I could not do one push-up. And this woman who was treating me for my back pain, which I have from playing the flute, because the flute goes sideways. And I think it's a lot better if they go straight. But um, she said, you know, one of the best things you can do to build up your back and build up your muscles is push-ups. And she had me do them against the wall. And so I was doing those little push-ups. And then I was doing a push-up where I just lowered myself down to the ground. That's it. In yoga, they would call that a chaturanga. I could barely do that. And I would just do one a day. And then I was able to go down and up. And then I would start to do a couple only downs and then, then I'd throw in some down and ups. And just by doing that, I was able to go from one push up a day, not even a push up, just a let down, to 20 push ups a day, which was my goal 20 push ups a day. I have this cute little muscle right there and I can flex it. And I go look in the mirror and I go, that's like me. And then I realized that I'm a person who does weight training. This was not who I was before, but this is who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a little more vital. I wanted to have more energy. And now I can say about myself, I am a person who exercises because those 20 push-ups, I then started adding more things to them and they became a, almost a 20, 30 minute workout every night that I do strength training, stretching, yoga stretches. So I had to believe. And part of believing is growth mindset work. We have to believe that we can change. And the research is out there that we can change at any age. We, you know, yes, we can change a little more drastically when we're young, but anyone can change. And our brains are capable of regenerating gray matter at every single day of our life. Um, so we have to really believe that. In we teach our kids about growth mindset, but we have to believe it about ourselves in this area. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. I used to um, tell this to my, my little elementary kids, but this is a little hard for them to get. It takes a little too long. So I found this wonderful sign that I put up in every classroom and I put this in every lecture that I had. It's the fabulous yet sign. When someone says they can't do something, you just point to the sign and you say, you can't do it yet. So I'm going to say to you, this person that you want to become, do you want to be the person that's more vital? Um, do you want to be someone who is an expert in a certain field? You're not there, but you're just not there yet and believe that you can get there. All right. So now let's talk about the tiny habits of which I am speaking to you about. In this book, BJ Fogg, he inspired um, James Clear. Basically, I think James Clear took the materials here and ran with it and, and just kept it going. So he would talk to us about the tininess of habits. And if they're that tiny, you are much more apt to be successful. Now, BJ Fogg talks about like a minute worth could be a habit or even 20 seconds could be a habit. Um, in James Clear's book, he talks about two minutes is like a minimum for a tiny habit, you know, two minutes of doing something. But there's also a wisdom that just showing up someplace could also be a habit. And I got the just show up, um, just the idea from this yoga teacher that I know. And she was telling me a story about her yoga teacher who taught her yogurt teacher, <laughs> yogurt, yoga teacher training class. And there was a question in the class to the teacher and the student asked, I'm having trouble developing my yoga practice. What advice do you have for me so that I can do my yoga every day? And the teacher said, just show up on your mat. Just show up on your mat. So for me, my first thing was I was just going to show up on my exercise mat where I did my push-up. Now I actually don't even have a mat. So I show up on the floor where there's a nice carpet and I can do it there. But this, the wisdom was show up on your mat, show up in the place where you could do this habit. And that could be the tiny habit. That could be it. And tiny habits make it easy to be successful. And they also inspire you because you feel so good about achieving them. So here I've come up with the just show up plan logo, which I cannot publicize or uh, really do anything with because I've stolen it completely from Nike. But you really could just decide to show up. 
just show up. If you want to meditate, just show up on your meditation cushion or in the chair where you want to meditate, just show up. And we talked about that power of one push-up. And after I did my push-up story, that after I did my push-up journey, of which I can tell you, I have only, I've never missed two days in a row of doing my push-ups. I do them every single day. It's going on about two and a half years now. So I'm crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm celebrating right now by telling you. So uh, I'm crazy proud of that. Um, Stephen Guys, in his book, Mini Habits, you can see there's a lot of books about this. He actually talks about the push-up and he talks about how he wanted to do a hundred push-ups. His goal is a little higher than mine. And he ended up doing one push-up a day. And he had what he called a floor goal or the minimum goal was he was going to do was just one. And then his ceiling goal was a hundred. He wasn't going to do more than a hundred. So um, you, what I'm going to encourage you to do with your goal, with your habit today is come up with a floor or a baseline. That's your minimum. For me, it's doing one pushup. One pushup is my baseline. So I, I upped it from showing up on the mat to going to one. Um, but whatever you can do that, you know, that you can absolutely do that every single day of your life. And uh, here are, in case you're interested in the pushups, there are many versions. I am on the modified pushup, but sometimes I can actually do a real pushup, which is very exciting. Doesn't matter where you start, only that you begin. So if there is something challenging, we just want you to begin. Now we're going to talk about celebration, which is, according to BJ Fogg, who wrote another book called Tiny Habits, and he's a professor at Stanford, he said, it is the most important skill for creating habits. He also says that if you can learn one thing from reading his book, you don't even have to read his book. I'm going to tell you the one thing. It's to know that celebration is the most important skill. So if you are doing a small habit and you don't care, you don't celebrate, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, I did it, I did my push-up. It's drudgery, but I did my push-up and I don't give myself any enjoyment out of that push-up. I am not going to continue doing it. But if I do my push-up and then I look in the mirror and I watch my muscle grow, then I get excited. Then I, I go around saying, yeah, that's like me. And like, I now can be a person who exercises. I am a person who exercises. So celebrating that is to him as important as the other two big things in mental training for him, which are meditation and gratitude practice. Um, he thinks those are the big three, meditation, gratitude practice, and celebration. So for us, I don't think we, at least I certainly didn't really take that much into account to make sure that I was celebrating what I was doing. And with our kids too, to make sure that we celebrate with them, if you are a music teacher, celebrate their achievements and you know really really you you see coaches they'll do it you know they're sitting there giving everybody high fives and doing it all and you know without being ingenuine we should do that for our kids all the time um in his book bj fogg talks about being flexible and celebrate whether you do 10 push-ups or one it's all about flexibility and build in the flexibility to miss a day now and then and I just get a really kick out of this. This is a Marine Corps unofficial uh, uh, um, little logo here. Semper Gumby, always flexible. Because, you know, if you're out there and then war is happening all around you and you didn't, weren't expecting this right there, you have to be flexible and you have to be able to maneuver all around. So make sure that you are flexible and you're forgiving with yourself if you don't achieve something or you might have to look and maybe that isn't the right habit for you but don't give up. Now we're gonna talk about connecting habits to new beginnings. This book, How to Change by Katie Milkman was the number one self-help book in the top 10 on the New York Times 2021 list. So it just came out. So I just read it and timely that I just read it because she talks about what she calls the fresh start effect. And the fresh start effect is that if you connect to, as we alluded to in the beginning, a new year, super duper powerful. A birthday, also really powerful. I connected um, some nice aerobic activity to my recent rather large birthday. And I'm, I'm so impressed with how I'm getting better every single day doing this little mini habit. Um, she, her research even found that Mondays are better than like a Saturday. You know, like if you can connect it to something. So having read this book, my, my new goal for myself is I'm going to try to establish a habit, a mini habit every month. 
And I've got a habit tracker that I'm going to show you guys that you can do this too, if you like. And I've got one from the whole year. And then each month, I'm going to come up with a nice little mini habit so that I can just compound my 1% gains and just get better and better. Ah, this reminds me of the, the last line in uh, Sunday in the Park with George, white, a blank page or canvas, so many possibilities. I just love that line. And then another line from the musical, the challenge, bring order to the whole through design, composition, tension, balance, light, and harmony. So bring order to the whole of our lives through design, through a plan. You know, don't, we won't rely on willpower because willpower is finite. We're going to rely on a plan that's going to make us better. And I just made this for you guys. In case you didn't see this go around at the beginning of COVID, I love this joke. Um, and I have named it Sunday in the Park with Just George. Now, connect your new habit to an existing habit. So this is in pretty much every um, book on habits. Um, it's in Katie Milkman's, it's in James Clear's. This is James Clear's writing. Um, there's many different ways people write it. Before or after, I do something, my old habit. I will, my new habit. So before or after I read my emails, I will bounce up and down for one minute. We're gonna talk about the power of bouncing for one minute. Um, that is a, that's been a goal of mine before, actually it's been after I read my emails, I will bounce for one minute. So that, that simple thing of doing something every day, my push-ups I do, and, and I, have, I went through COVID as I was doing it and we were home a lot. So it actually really helped to establish it. When I sit down to the, to the TV at night, after I've done all my work and I watch television with my husband and we watch the news, I did my push-ups. That's when I did my push-ups and my stretching. It was a habit we already had. We ate dinner together. We sat down in front of the television and then I was always there. I had a habit of this already and I could easily put my push-ups into that habit. I have a habit of meditating every day and um, I, that was a struggle to, to establish also, but I take baths every day. And even though it's not, is, you know, it's not traditional sit up nice and tall meditation, it's still meditation and stillness and mental training. And I do it every day when I take my bath. So if you can connect, find a way to connect what you're doing, that would be that much easier for you. Um, some people call it a, a life with living by algorithms. If blank, then blank. I actually never saw this musical, but I think it's interesting that it was called If Then, and I'd like to know what it's about. So you want to establish habits that run on autopilot, like my meditation runs on autopilot, unless I don't bathe, which doesn't happen, luckily, for everyone around me very often. Um, now we're going to talk about measuring your habit, because... People who measure things actually seem to do better than people who don't. Measuring just plain old helps us achieve our goals. There is a research study about um, walking and they had this group of people, they gave half of them pedometers. This is an old fashioned pedometer um, and told them to walk as much as they could in a week. And then they had the other half and they just said, walk as much as you can in the week. By the end of the week, and they did this over time, the people with the pedometers on average walked one mile more than the people without the pedometers. Measuring just helps us. And committing to something also helps us. Committing to telling someone about our habit, telling someone about our resolution, gives just us a little more owning of it and it helps us to achieve our goal. I have made for you a habit tracker that you are welcome to use and you certainly don't have to, but one, one way that people think that you can celebrate is simply by putting a check on a habit tracker. And right here, oh no, it's all blurry. Oh no, sorry about that. My blurred background is blurring my habit tracker. But I have been keeping track of my new year's resolution and I just put little checks every day here. I've written down my resolution. I'm saying when I will do this, basically after I do this, I will do that. What is my minimum amount that I wanna do and what am I working up to? So here on this little worksheet that you have in your handout, it's also on my website. My website is teachingpositivity.com. You can find all sorts of other stuff on there. I've got posters for teachers and lots of cool stuff that you might like. 
So this is just a little um, a little reminder, and this is an easy way to celebrate. You know, you can make a big deal out of it, make a little deal, but you're still acknowledging it. And that is the important part. So establish that tiny habit and the goal habit. We talked about that too. You want to just make sure there's one little thing. For me, it was my one repetition of my push-up. My goal habit was 20. You do want to stretch a little bit for your goals because if you make your goal too easy, like I'm just going to do two push-ups every day, although quite frankly, honestly, that would still be pretty good. Um, but you want to make your goal a little challenging and that makes it a little more likely that you will achieve it. And of course, there's a sweet spot. You don't want to be make it pie in the sky. You want to make it realistic. So now I'm just going to talk two seconds about practice records for those music teachers out there to require a practice record or not to require a practice record. That is the question. We all know the danger of that practice record and how the parents lie and how the children tell you that they practice an hour every day, even though they can't play hot cross buns. Um, so on my new practice record, I've come up with, oh, and I will tell you that I have in my career, I gave up on practice records after a while because if those of you who've used them know they're really tedious and horrible and nobody likes them and the parents lie and the kids lie. Um, so I gave them up and the practicing level of my kids went down. It was just, you know, I wasn't a scientist. I didn't measure it, but I saw it and the achievement level that they had was less. So I put them right back in and just kept my, you know, just put up with the problems of making sure you have a practice record. So I've also made, and it's in the handout. Um, actually, is this in that? No, this one's not in the hand or is it? I'm not sure, but it's definitely on my website. Um, this is a just show up practice record for your kids. And I decided that, you know, maybe just showing up wouldn't be quite enough. They have to, they have to do the James Clear minimum of two minutes. So if they did for two minutes, they can put a check. If they do for 15 minutes, they can put two checks. And if they do 30 minutes, which was my goal for my elementary kids, they could do three. Um, so I think this is a nice way of creating a minimum, getting a habit, try not to miss two days in a row, and just making it a little bit more fun. And here I had them attach your practicing to an, a, to an existing habit. After I blank, I will practice. I'll just show you, I put a couple of comics on my practice record. Um, I saw actually that Felicia put the, um, the packet in the link. I'm pretty sure now that that practice record is not in the packet, but it is definitely on my website. So if you go to teachingpositivity.com, you'll see it right in the resource section. So I love this one. I don't want to practice. I want to skip ahead to the part where I'm awesome. I just think that pack says a lot to kids, you know, without you beating them over the head saying, you know, you have, you're going to be horrible if you don't practice. You know, this one, you know, in a funny way says the same thing. This one, actually, um, I just like this one. Come on, Mike, how are you going to go get anywhere with this thing if you don't practice? I do practice, Uncle Phil. I practice all the time. Okay, show me something you've practiced. And then he's spinning his, I don't even think that's possible, but that's what he's doing. Never miss twice. There's a story that's going around the positive psychology world about um, about Seinfeld, thank you, about Seinfeld. And, and this young comic asked Seinfeld, you know, how did you get so good at writing jokes? And Seinfeld says, well, I write a joke every single day. And then the, the young comic says, well, wow, that's great. Wow, what if you miss a day? And he goes, well, if I miss a day, it's the next thing I do the next morning. So basically what Seinfeld is saying in this story is that he never misses twice. And there's research out there that supports this. If you have a habit, and you, you know, like people say, oh, it takes 30 days to make a habit. Oh, it takes 18. No, it takes three months. The, the real answer is it takes as long as it takes. Um, but if you have a, a daily habit and you miss two days, people have said that really derails the habit. So if you can not miss two days in a row and try to get that instilled in your kids too, just do something every day and never, never miss twice. So now we're gonna go on to my A major collection of tiny self-care habits for you to consider in case you have not, um, in case you have not made your resolution or how you can tweak the one that you have to fit in with this tiny habits. All right, so the following habits that I'm gonna to talk to you about have been researched to make you happier. And the research that I came across first came from this book by Sean Aker, The Happiness Advantage. And this is not in your handout, but he has a fabulous TED talk called This Happy Secret to Better Work. And if you just Google Sean Aker TED talk, it's one of the most viewed TED talks of all. Absolutely fabulous research about what makes you happier. And 
these habits, these fundamental habits that we're going to talk about do make you happier. So I'm just going to quote a little from the book. So forgive the wordiness here. Dopamine, which floods into your system when you're positive, not only makes you happier, it turns on all of the learning centers in your brain, allowing you to adapt to the world in a different way. Your brain at positive is 31% more productive than your brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. That's how psychologists talk. Apparently, your brain is at positive or you're neutral or you're negative or you're stressed. Um, so you're more productive, 31%. You're 37% better at sales if you register as positive, as happier. You're 19% faster, more accurate at coming up with a correct diagnosis when doctors are positive. Teachers who are more optimistic, which is certainly a trait of happy people, outperform their peers. That research was done by Angela Duckworth. The rest of this is in um, Sean Aker's book. But I like that dopamine, dopamine, which floods your system when you're positive, not only makes you happier, it turns on all the learning centers in your brain. And that celebration that BJ Fogg is talking about, he talks about that dopamine that floods your brain when you celebrate turns on all the learning resources in your brain. All right, let's see. And in Sean Aker's book, he talks about how positive psychology has decided, not decided, but looks at if we can change the lens through which we all look at the world, if we can change it towards the positive, everything in our life is going to be better. And it's proven that it is. See what they're finding, he says in another quote, it's not necessarily the reality of our world that shapes us, but the lens through which our brain views the world that shapes your reality. And if we can change the lens, not only can we change your happiness, we can change every single educational and business outcome at the same time. All of these self-care habits that I'm gonna to talk to you about have been proven to change the lens through which you look at the world and make you happier. And if you're happier, you're more productive, you're more successful, you have better relationships. So all of these, if you change the lens with the, in a fundamental way with fundamentals that we're gonna talk about here. My dear friend, Carol Purdy says, wherever you're sitting, foul weather or fair, if the view is depressing, just turn the chair. And some of these mental training fundamentals we're gonna talk about enable you to turn the chair, to look at life through a lens of gratitude, through a lens of optimism. So we're gonna change our lens or turn our chair by honoring our fundamentals. Our physical fundamentals are eating, moving, sleeping. Our mental fundamentals are that we're calm, that we're optimistic, that we're full of gratitude for life, that we're happy. And we may have a unique um, fundamental. I see someone in there wanted to ski and this is a unique fundamental to him that makes him happier. So we're gonna start with moving because moving, it might be on some of your lists. So exercise has been proven to be an effective strategy for overcoming depression and for making our brains more malleable. So not only are you getting stronger, but you're warding off depression, you're building up your muscles and your brain becomes more malleable, easy, more easily changed. So that growth mindset part of your brain can actually change. We can develop new neural pathways. And that's absolutely amazing. That's new research that just came out that I read about recently about research that people who exercise brains really were more malleable. They were more easily, could more easily learn. So I also really love this picture because if I'm feeling down or depressed, I think of my brain as looking like that brain on the left, or is that your right? It's, it's gonna be your left, sorry. Um, and then look at the brain on your right. After 20 minutes, that's what happens with a 20 minute walk. And we know this, we, we do know this. As soon as we walk out of the house, I used to say, when I walk out of the house, magical things happen. You know, if you stay in the house and you stay in, you know, things can get a little down. But if you walk out, just walk out and our brains will light up like that. I have good news for you, 10,000 steppers. You only need 5,649 steps to ward off depression, according to Kelly McGonigal in The Joy of Movement. And the 10,000 step bar is completely made up by a Tokyo clockmaker who had just made a pedometer and he was trying to sell pedometers. And he came up with an advertising um, campaign that says, hit your 10,000 steps a day. And uh, he made it up. There's no validity. So this amount of steps will actually ward off depression and I just read in the New York Times that 7,000 steps will make you live longer. 
So you don't have to get to 10,000. 10,000 maybe makes you a little longer. In this research that I do have in the handout, um, past 10,000 steps didn't have an effect. Um, I think way past maybe even had a negative effect, but uh, that this was you lived longer and you were healthier. They talk about in this article that I um, have in the handout, they talk about the popularity of exercise snacks and the research now on little bursts of energy, high intensity training um, throughout a gentle workout. Let's say there's one research study that you, sim you, uh, you walked for 10 minutes, just walked 10 minutes. And then for three 20 second intervals, you ran as fast as you could, um, that's it. Um, that made people live longer and healthier lives. 20, I mean, that was really one minute of exercise. And they just have new studies on that all the time and they call them exercise snack. Um, shaking is something that you can do with your, with your kids. Just um, get up and shake every, you know, every 30 minutes, they want us to have one minute of movement. Um, there is a shake your bones exercise that Dr. Andrew Weil talks about where you just, you do kind of more vigorous shaking like this. And you do that for a minute. And that is that moves all of the lymph in, in your lymph system that has no way to move unless we move it, which is, I, I, I don't know, that was news to me. Like, oh, that's why we have to. And that's why yoga is so good for us because we're moving slowly, but our lymph is moving as we're moving that. So we are actually, it's like a, the pump for our lymph system. All right, my screen is all about eating, not about shaking. So we're gonna just talk super quick about eating because there are many paths to eating enlightenment and I do not claim to know the right one, but almost all of these paths tell us to eat less sugar. And I'm also now in a wellness diet thing to start the new year. Um, and they're talking about mindful eating. And one of the questions is that rather than going on a diet, they're saying, ask yourself before you put food in your mouth, how is this going to make me feel? And that could be a tiny habit before you eat something, how is this gonna make me feel? And just do that one time a day, just once, every day, one time a day before you have breakfast, you know, come up with a time that you would say that. You can also say thank you before you take a bite of your food, just to slow yourself down so you're not doing that compulsive eating. Sleeping is the foundation for all of our habits. So let's talk about how we can sleep better. Stop eating two hours before bed. That is, you know, that's been around a really long time, but it's absolutely true. I have this ring called an aura ring that gives me all sorts of data about my sleep and my exercise. And when I eat too late at night, I disrupt my deep sleep. Um, my brain is too busy digesting my food. And then my brain, your brain needs energy to go into deep restorative sleep. I don't pretend to understand it, but it has something to do with the glymph, I believe. And it cleans, it's like a little cleaner in our brain. And it takes up energy. So if you're, energy, if you're digesting your food, you don't have the energy that it takes to kind of clean out your brain and reset for the next day. Um, bad news about alcohol too. During COVID, I, I did drink a little more than I usually did. And I, I drank every single night. You know, I had a glass of wine with my husband every single night. When I stopped it, when I learned that alcohol really disrupts your deep sleep and it, and it also it does wake you up in the middle of the night, but the real problem is that the quality of sleep that you get is not as good as if you don't drink. So if you have a really important thing to do the next day, try not drinking that the night before, you know, you could try just taking out, taking it out a little less. I had to go cold Turkey. I got myself some fake wine and I just went cold Turkey on that one. All right. Now we're going to talk about gratitude practices. So I like this cartoon. What if today we were just grateful for everything? And some people think that this actually is the road to enlightenment. That right there, they're Charlie Brown and Snoopy. That's it. That's all we need to say. Um, but there's a lot of research behind gratitude. The queen of research is Sonia Lierbermirsky. Lier and there's many other researchers out there. But gratitude practices um, help in every single aspect of our life. It's pretty endless what they do. And you can come up with a little, little tiny gratitude practices. Um, the traditional gratitude practice is a gratitude journal. You write down three things you're grateful for every night before you go to sleep. In a study over, I think it was six weeks, the people rated themselves 25% happier after they did just that. And I had a friend that I knew who was um, in trouble. Um, he was in trouble in his job. He would always be complaining. Um, two years went by and I saw him and I said, oh my goodness, what, what's happened? You've changed, you look awesome. And I said, what did you do? Are you exercising? Are you eating right? And he goes, no, I, I, I did a gratitude journal. 
this, this, this man was transformed. That's my unofficial study of one person. Um, but if you don't want to write things down, you could, as a mini habit, just think of one thing you're grateful for as your evening prayer, right before you go to sleep. Think of one thing you're grateful for. Um, this, this place, Greater Good in Action, um, has a bunch of wonderful things that you can use for yourself, for your kids, just exercises on how to take care of these fundamentals we're talking about. They have a gratitude journal for students that you could find there. You could take a gratitude walk where you just walk around and, uh, and be grateful for the trees. Then I have come up with grateful teeth brushing. While I brush my teeth, I think of one thing that I'm grateful for, the water. Awesome that we have water, the toothbrush. You know, the people that made the toothbrush, you know, just think of when, you know, I'm attaching it to something. So just a little tiny, tiny habit. So now we're going to talk about meditation and we're going to demystify meditation for those of you who think that it is ever so slightly challenging, which it might be for some people. So in August of 2003, Time magazine had on its cover this lovely blonde woman and uh, had a, a list of all of the things that meditation could help you with. Now in 2014, another lovely blonde woman is now calling it mindfulness, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, meditation, they just stopped using because it was associated with Buddhism and Hinduism and uh, people didn't want that coming into their schools. So they're calling it mindfulness now, but it is the same thing. It is really just training your brain to concentrate and get rid of all the noise. In the 2014 article, it says one interesting tidbit from the 2014 article is how it is now so trendy to do mindfulness in Silicon Valley that if you're not doing it, eyebrows will be raised. Um, I think many, many people in Silicon Valley are meditating. They probably need to after staring at those screens all day. Um, thousands of things, it gets better. If you have anything wrong with you, just Google, uh, the, will meditation help this? And it will. And there's one thing that meditation does. It, it calms you right down. It gets you into what they call the return. Um, Wirecutter just rated the top meditation apps for 2021, and it's one is Headspace, which I have used, and Calm, which I have not, but I've heard wonderful things about both of them. And I went to a meditation teacher named Dave Wagner, who told me that it is okay to slouch. As a matter of fact, he wanted the cover of his meditation magazine to have him all slouched down in his chair when he's meditating. The thing about sitting up straight came from a quote of the Buddha who said, when you meditate, sit with dignity and take that digni dignity out into the world with you. Great, wonderful, fabulous. I was not able to do that. I would come home from school. I would try to sit with dignity on my pillow and I was just so tired and I didn't wanna sit with dignity. And I, I actually did meditate that way for um, quite a few months actually. But uh, now that I'm in my tub and I have been, uh, it's been blessed by this meditation teacher that I can slouch. This the only trouble is I might drown in the bathtub if I become really, really meditative, but I'm going to take that chance because I'm very tall and I probably won't drown. All right, there's four elements to any mindfulness practice. First, you have to get still. Second, you have to focus on something. Could be anything, could be your breath. That's number one. You return to the stillness if your mind wanders. You don't judge and say, oh my gosh, I have a monkey brain. I'm terrible, I can't do this. You just say, oh well, and you start again. So you say that, oh, well, with compassion. The power of saying, oh, well, and start again will take you through anything in your life, anything that goes wrong. Some people like there's, I'm forgetting his name, but his answer is, you know, everything that happens to him in his life, he goes, good, good, it's all good. Um, yeah, it might be good, but, and you can learn from everything in your life, but I like this one, just, oh, well, nothing to be done if there's truly nothing to be done and then start again. And if there is something you can do differently, you do something differently. And in meditation, this is how you can really just learn to meditate. Just say, oh, well, don't judge. The fact that you're meditating is going to have, is going to create some of these wonderful effects that you want, these, these effects of calmness and stillness. I, I find that I get, I get some wonderful stuff when I'm meditating. One day I'm meditating in my bathtub, and it dawns on me that I have, I've sent my program to the printer for this orchestra I play in. And I forgot to tell the printer to copy on both sides of the sheet of paper. You know how you have to copy both sides. I forgot to click that. And I'm sitting in the bathtub going, oh my gosh, I think I forgot to click that. I think I forgot. So I get out of the bathtub. I finish my meditation 
And sure enough, I had forgotten to click that. Actually, to the printer's credit, they had emailed me and asked, uh, you didn't, I didn't click this, but you know, stuff like that will just come to you. And it's because you're still. Um, ever make mistakes in life? Let's make them birds. Yeah, they're birds now. So when you make a mistake in life or in meditation, make it a bird and move on. Angela Duckworth is a, a prominent positive psychologist from um, the University of Pennsylvania. She says, if she ever gets a tattoo, which I don't think she has yet, this is what it's going to say. Fall seven times, stand up eight. It's about grit. It's about keeping going. It's about starting again and learning from what just happened. All right. There's a loving kindness meditation that is very, very interesting. Um, this was researched by Barbara Fredrickson in a book called Love 2.0. Well, she reports on it in this book. And this is an old Buddhist prayer that um, many religions have adapted. There's Christian version, there's a Jewish version, um, many, many different wordings. And it starts like this, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, may you live with ease. Then you move to someone right, right next to you that you love. May my husband be safe, may my husband be healthy, may my husband be happy and may he live with ease. Then you can bless the people around your life. Then you bless to someone you don't really know. May my mailman be safe. May my mailman be healthy. May he be happy. May he live with ease. And then you go to something, somebody challenging. May this principal who I don't get along with be safe. May he be healthy. May he be happy. May he live with ease. And just so you know, principals listening to this, who've had you, it, I, I made that one up. It wasn't you, I promise. You weren't the challenging people. And then you take it to somebody that you really, really, really have trouble with. You bless them. You wish for them good things. This doesn't change the outward reality. It changes your brain, softens your brain, and it makes you kinder and able to have a little warmer relationships with all of those around you. Um, Andrew, Lloyd, Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Wright and Dr. Andrew Weil says if he could teach people one thing, he would teach them how to breathe. He talks about a longer exhale breath where you breathe in for four, you hold for seven, you breathe out for eight. Now he actually is sad that there isn't a lot of research. Everything else I'm telling you about today has tons of research behind it. This one doesn't. I've really looked hard to find any research on this. And I finally found something where he's frustrated that there's no research on this, but there is research on one called a, a square breath. You breathe in for four, hold for four, breathe out for four, hold for four. His um, thing, and this is a traditional yogic breath, so this breath has been around a long time, is that you feel that relaxation response when you exhale. So I'm gonna have you guys do a little work right here with me. I'm gonna set a little tempo, breathe in for four, hold for seven, out for eight. Ready, breathe in. One, two, hold for seven. One, two, three, four, five, and out for eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, in for four. One, two, three, four, hold for seven, three, four, five, six, out for eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, in the, um, in the chat, I only did that twice. Did anyone feel a relaxation response as that was happening? The kids will feel it. And this is a great thing to do. I'm actually a little bit sorry that I, I meant to write out in smart music this as a warm up for a band, you know, and you could have four, four measure, then you could have a seven, eight measure, and then you could have two whole notes tied for the eight beat. But, you know, you could just do it as warm ups and teach them about time signatures at the same time. You can make any combination you want. Four, two, eight is good. Yay. Paulo said he could feel it. Um, and Deborah, my friend, said she could feel it. It's, it's amazing how fast you can feel that. Now I just wanna show you one other moment of Zen that you could find. This is a Monterey Bay jelly cam and we're just going to watch it. This is live jelly cam footage from an uh, from a aquarium in California. Actually think the music to that is absolutely fabulous too. So if you want to put that on um, while you do a meditation practice, put on that jelly cam and uh, 
or put it, the music. I don't, I meant to go in and see what that music is, but it's pretty meditative and quite wonderful. I was going to lead you in a meditation with that behind, but it actually doesn't work that well um, over Zoom. It, it kind of gets muddled the sound. So I want you to do that at home. Somebody said they want to get organized. This transformed my organizational life and it's called a bullet journal. And in the handout, there's a five minute um, little blurb on YouTube telling you how to do it. The real beauty of the bullet journal is that there's an index. So it's just like any other journal. It's, this is a calendar. You can be any kind of journal you want. I use it as a calendar and a to-do list. I was very to-do list challenged. I would lose them. I didn't even want to write them down or I'd put them in my phone and then I'd never look at them. But this is this is a game changer. Um, so that index you can put in and let's say you're buying a new something. You just see, you can put notes in about it, put it in the index and then go look for it. I am running out of time here. So we're going to have a few jokes. Pink Panthers to-do list. All right. Now it's time to talk about your tiny habit. Who would you like to be? So which area, if improved, would help you to become the person you want to be? Vitality, gratitude, calm, breathwork, organization. We didn't talk about humor, but humor makes us happier and is definitely, we should look at that. Connection makes us happier. That's a whole other, whole other seminar. So take a moment and think about what tiny habit will help you become the person or teacher that you want to be. Charles Duhigg in a book called um, The Power of Habit says, if it's, if it's a, the right habit, a keystone habit will spark chain reactions that help the other good habits take hold. My push-up for me was a keystone habit. You'll know as you think about what habits are there out there, which one do you think would make the best, the biggest difference in your life? In your handout, I have this workshop, work, <laughs> worksheet, and um, you can go through it to help you figure out what that habit is. Um, just a little reminder, by fine tuning hints, start in a new beginning, make it tiny, celebrate, measure, attach it to an existing habit. In the worksheet, I just blew some of it up so you can see it. What kind of person do you wanna be? Start with that. I actually, in my bullet journal, I put that, that kind of person that I wanna be on every page. I am somebody who exercises. I am, you know, the people that I want to be. So find that out. You're going to make your habit super, super, super small. It could be 20 seconds of a habit. You're going to find out when you want to do it, attach it to something. You're going to figure out a reward. Is it just saying, just like me in the, in the mirror? Is it the habit check? Or is it a little piece of dark chocolate that you always want and you don't let yourself eat, but you could eat it now. And you want a minimum habit and a goal habit. So it is just a time, just a question of time, patience, and intelligent work. Just like we would tell our kids when we work on things, be patient. It's not going to happen. Life change doesn't happen overnight. Mastering great works of music doesn't happen overnight. Great things just don't. They are a question of time, patience, and intelligent work. Um, a little shout out to this man who has totally inspired me. This is my coaching programs leader, his name is Brian Johnson. And um, he wrote um, six page summaries of 600 self-help books and um, spiritual motivational books that you can find on his website, optimize.me. He used to charge for access to them, but now it is completely free. That access is um, available to everyone. You can read the six page um, review that he has of all the books that I talked about today. Um, be not afraid of going slowly. Be afraid only of standing still. Then I have one last joke for you. My favorite joke. This time I won't screw up, says Roger, as he's holding one symbol. And the title is Roger Screws Up. We will screw up. We will. But if we love ourselves, if we love our students, if we love our profession, everything is going to be fine if we learn from that. And when we mess up, we just say, oh, well, and we start again. And may your new year be full of many tiny possibilities. I have to thank Felicia and Alfred Music and Smart Music and each one of you for being here. Um, you've been, um, I'm deeply honored that you spent this hour with me. You can reach out to me at any time if you have questions. And I know Felicia, if you had questions, you could put them in the chat really quickly and I will answer them for you. And Felicia, why don't you take that away? Yeah, we do have one question for you from William. Okay. And he says, where are you with measuring established benchmarks to validate via demonstration performance skills? Where am I? So read that, say that question again. 
Where are you with measuring established benchmarks to validate via demonstration performance skills? I think this I don't, if, if I understand, I'm sorry, Felicia, say that again. I think this question came in uh, when we were talking about the practice logs. I think that um, to measure, like to have a, a different, like a achievement levels that each kid would have to to meet and and have those as your assignments. You know, you have to know three skills, maybe you have to know four. But I actually, if I understand the question correctly, I think I absolutely agree with it. Have achievement levels that the kids work towards making, like um, recorder karate is one. You know, here you get a ribbon for for hot cross buns. Now you get a really a lovely ribbon if you get Yankee Doodle. Um, you know, where you let the kids know where they're expected to go and what skills they're expected to learn. I'm, I'm all for that. If I hope I answered his question or her question, but uh, I would say I'd be for that. All right, that's all our questions. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again.